So what AWS tells us about BCP is that your disaster recovery strategy should be based on business requirements, priorities and context. So you might ask me what is BCP or business continuity plan? So business continuity plan is the process involved in creating a system of prevention and recovery from potential threats to the company. So you might be thinking we'll have a disaster recovery in place and it will work fine and it will have no issues, but it's not always the case. I'll tell you a few scenarios or situations where the BCP strategy or disaster recovery strategy can be of very less impact. So let's suppose you are selling a product online and you have a multi AZ and multi region setup to help disaster recovery. As I already told you, that product was launched with a particular flavor and that flavor caused a lot of allergies after five days of use. But you already had sold 50,000 units and your business outcome depends on that now. In this situation, only God can save you. No disaster recovery strategy can save you. You might be thinking, I'm just launching an EC2 instance. How will it impact me? So if you're working on a project or application at your office or startup, for you, it might be an application where you're implementing some features and writing some code. But for the people who make the decision to allot a budget on your project, for them, it's a product from which they're expecting to make money. It's a business for them. They're not doing it for a charity. So when you design an application on the cloud or infrastructure, the cost and budgeting are a business constraint and it will be approved by the people sitting at the highest order. And that is why your disaster recovery strategy should be based on business requirements, priorities and context. When creating a disaster recovery strategy, we must plan for recovery objectives and they are recovery time objective RTO and recovery point objective that is RPO. So imagine this is the timeline and this is the point of the disaster. Listen to this very carefully. Recovery point objective or RPO is the maximum acceptable amount of time since the last data recovery point. So this is your recovery point. What it means is that between the disaster and the recovery point using which you can recover your data, this period that you see here is the amount of data that you can afford to lose. That is why that period here is mentioned as data loss. That is why it is mentioned here that it is the maximum acceptable time or acceptable amount of time since the last data recovery point. So as an organization, we define what is considered an acceptable loss of data between the last recovery point and the interruption of service. That is why it is called a recovery point objective. So we have to define this objective. And there is another one, another objective that we have that is called the recovery time objective. So RTO is the maximum acceptable delay between the interruption of the service and the restoration of the service from the time that it went bad till the time it went to the acceptable state. So as an organization, if you define that one hour is the RTO or the recovery time objective, then within that time, you should be able to restore your service from interruption. That's the acceptable amount that you have. So the time frame that you see here, the time frame that you see here is the acceptable time window for service interruptions. That is why it is mentioned here how quickly you must recover and what is the cost of the downtime. So now that we have the intro in place, let's talk about these in detail in step seven and eight. So what you see here is the cost and complexity versus length of service interruption graph. So as we know, RTO is the maximum acceptable delay between the interruption of service and restoration of service. But in order to give the user the best possible resolution, the cost to business will remain the biggest differentiator. So you might ask me how? And for that, I'll tell you a very small example here. So please listen to this very carefully and you decide what exactly is the differentiator. So I'm going to give you an example here as to how you should imagine this graph. Let's suppose I give you a device that is broken and I ask you to repair it. And you tell me that it will cost you around $100 and it will take five hours for you to get it repaired. Okay, that's good, but I want it to be repaired much faster. So I visit another shop or person and ask him to repair it. So that person said that he or she is going to charge me around $500 and it will be repaired in one hour. So this is very good in terms of time, but I don't have $500. So it's something that my business cannot afford. 
So I visited another repair shop and he said I'll charge you around 250 dollars and it'll take you around two hours to the repair to be done. So that sounds reasonable, isn't it? Based on the time and cost it provides me. So now tell me what was the deciding factor here? Was it the cost or was it the time? Yeah, it was both but in consideration with my business outcome. So I can afford to pay $250 and wait for two hours of service interruption. That's the maximum acceptable delay between the interruption of service and the restoration of service. And this is your length of service interruption in time scale. And this is the amount of cost and complexity of the process to bring the service back to life. And this is the cost of business impact. And each disaster recovery strategy will fall into one of these categories as we have mentioned here. So the first one is that is multi-site that is active active where you create a second active replica setup of your service and which is one of the best when it comes to time but too much for the cost side because it exceeds our acceptable recovery cost. So the next best approach is considering the time factor that is warm standby where you have a scaled down version of a fully functional environment that is always running in the cloud. This is optimal for disaster recovery, but reasonable on cost as well. Next comes pilot light disaster recovery strategy. So in pilot light approach, the most core components and services of your application are replicated in another region, like your most important data and storage replicas and other services are turned off and only used when testing or only used during testing. So that is pilot light. And when you face any challenges, then you can rapidly launch the whole setup when you need it. So this is very good when it comes to cost and also reasonable when we consider the recovery time objective as it falls within the criteria. Then comes backup and restore, which is like extreme cost saving, but also provides a very slow recovery time. So here you back up your data and application from anywhere like other location or on premise to the AWS cloud for your application usage. So this will surely take a lot of time because you have to set up everything in another location. But having said that, it's not that you're going to choose multi-site active active always to save time. No, you should not do that. The disaster recovery approach depends on your business outcome, as I told you. And it does not make sense in most of the cases because to run a full scale setup across multiple regions or locations, you have to pay an enormous amount considering the cost. So think about what fits best for your business before taking into consideration any of these approaches. But if you see here, as per the graph, the warm standby and the pilot light are very good approaches when it comes to cost and time.